All of us have probably thought about losing fat at some point, and maybe you're even thinking about it now with the new year upon us. You're thinking of joining the hordes of other sweaty people as they pack into the gyms this January with the common quest or new year's resolution to burn fat or lose weight. But there's a lot of confusion when it comes to burning fat, and frankly, a lot of myths. So in today's video, we're gonna talk about the most effective ways of burning fat, and this is gonna be based on physiology as well as the data. We'll also have some discussions around the confusion and myths with the fat burning zones, as well as address, can you actually target certain areas of the body to pull fat from based on exercise choice? It's gonna be a fun and interesting one, and maybe even a little bit controversial. So let's jump right into this anatomical awesomeness. So a few quick key points when it comes to fat. Fat is often referred to as adipose tissue, so I'm gonna use those terms interchangeably. And adipose tissue is found in various places throughout the body. Some of the main places are deep to the skin or this third layer down that is called the hypodermis or the subcutaneous layer. It's found surrounding organs, within the liver, and even some fat can be stored in skeletal muscles. But the area that we're typically the most concerned when it comes to where fat is, is that hypodermis, because that's superficial or on top of the muscle. And generally we like our muscles to be able to shine through. So the idea is if that hypodermis or that adipose tissue is a little bit thinner, it's going to be easier to see a rippling biceps or a rippling rectus abdominis muscle. And just to be clear, the street term for rectus abdominis is the six pack muscle. And you are in luck because all of us have one of those. It's just whether or not the hypodermis or that adipose is thin enough for us to see it. So let's now cover this idea of, is there an actual fat burning zone that we should get into? And is there an ideal or best type of exercise that gets us there? And for us to best understand that, we do need to talk about the energy sources that our working or exercising skeletal muscles will utilize. And that primarily is either carbohydrates or fats. I say primarily because there are certain cases where we can use proteins for energy, but the studies and the data we're really gonna hone into focused on this ratio of carbohydrates to fats being burned during different types or intensities of exercise. So for example, we're gonna see that somebody doing some form of exercise or a certain intensity, they might be burning 70% fats and only 30% carbs at that type of exercise. And then we might flip flop it to another intensity and we might see that changes to 80% carbs and 20% fats being utilized. And so you might think, okay, I need to find that type or form or intensity of exercise where I'm burning the highest percentage of fats. But we're gonna find that there's a little bit more to it than just that. For example, one of the times that we burn the highest percentage or portion of fats to carbs is actually at rest. And most of us have a pretty good idea that sitting on our gluteus maximus or on our butts is probably not an effective strategy to actually burn a lot of fat. So like I said, there's a bit more to it than that. So let's get into that. But real quick, before we get into the fat burning zones and the different types of exercise, I wanna take a second to say thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens is a nutritional company that makes an amazing nutritional drink called AG1. AG1 is far more than just a greens powder, as it's packed with 75 different ingredients that includes vitamins, minerals, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. Now I am all about simplifying my morning routine, and AG1 has helped me to do this. I no longer have to open up multiple pill bottles as this has helped me to completely replace my daily vitamin. All I do is take that wonderful AG1 bottle, fill it up with eight ounces of water, take one scoop and shake it up and then dump it in the oral cavity. And as an added bonus, it positively stimulates your gustatory receptors or your taste buds as it tastes great prior to moving down to the fundus of your stomach. Now we are obviously gonna talk about exercise and how that relates to fat burning. And I think we can all agree that exercise becomes more enjoyable and more effective when we feel like we can perform at a high level as well as recover quickly between workouts. And AG1 can help with this, as again, it's packed with superfoods and things like magnesium that can help with muscle recovery. It can also help boost energy levels, which is a huge plus for me because I'm not a big coffee drinker, nor do I drink any other beverages with caffeine for that matter. AG1 is also NSF certified, which is super important to me because I wanna know what's on the label is actually found within the product. So if you're interested, go to athleticgreens.com slash human anatomy, and they'll give our audience a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D3 plus K2, as well as five free travel packets with your first purchase. We'll also have that link in the description below. So let's get into some of these details about this potential fat burning zone. And we've got this chart to help us out with this. And when I first came across a chart that was similar to this years ago as a student, I was totally fascinated because it really helps to show how exercise intensity influences how our bodies utilize 
fats compared to carbohydrates and will help us find this fat burning zone. Also keep in mind that this data came from a male in his 40s that was training for a marathon. So these numbers and percentages won't be the exact same in me or you, but the numbers would be close. But the overall pattern that we're going to see is going to be important of the carbohydrate to fat ratio. And that pattern can definitely be applied to all of us. So we're going to take a given exercise intensity. And at a given intensity, we're going to see a percentage of the energy burned is going to come from fat. Percentage of energy is going to come from carbohydrates. We'll look at the total amount of calories burned in a minute. And of those total calories, how many came from fat and how many came from carbohydrates. So again, let's just start with 72. This was slightly above rest for this person. And at this level of intensity, you see 78.2% of that energy came from fat and only 21.8% came from carbs. And a knee-jerk reaction of us might be, ah, I want to be here at this percentage. But again, as I alluded to earlier, being at rest or slightly above rest probably isn't the best strategy for burning fat or losing weight in this case. And the ratios are only part of the story. We have to look at this total amount of calories burned, and we only burned 1.4 in this case, 1.1 of those coming from fat and 0.3 coming from the carbohydrates. But let's see what happens when we increase the intensity. We jump up to 127 beats per minute, and look what happens to the percentage of fat utilized. Jumps down to 40.8% where the carbs jump up to 59.2%. So again, knee-jerk reaction, you might be thinking, eh, I don't want to do that if I want to burn fat. But again, I know I'm a broken record here, the ratios are not the only thing. We've got to look at the total. We went from 1.4 all the way up to 11.5. And that 11.5 is such a big increase that even 40.8% of that 11.5 still gives us a total of 4.7 of those calories coming from fat, which you can see is definitely better than the 1.1. And obviously the carbohydrates are gonna go up mirroring that percentage increase for the carbohydrates at that intensity. If we continue to increase the intensity, what happens? 138, we see the percentage of fat utilized continues to go down. The percentage of carbohydrates utilized continues to go up. Total calories burned are always gonna to continue to go up when we increase the intensity, which will be important a little bit later in the video, but again, of that 13.4, 37.4% of 13.4 gives us five. So we continued to increase the amount, the total amount of fat that we burned at this intensity compared to this intensity. Now this is only going to continue to a certain point and we've pretty much reached it with this graph because as you can see on the next line down, as we increase the intensity further, that percentage continues to drop for fats, the percentage continues to increase for carbohydrates utilized, total caloric intake makes sense is going to continue to go up but 30.6% of 14.2 only gives us 4.4. So this is better than this, definitely, but it's not even better than these two levels of intensity. And again, continuing on with the level of intensity, you go down to 27.2% of fat, 72.8, and then we're only burning 4.2 of those total calories from fat. So before we kind of get to this ideal zone that I'm sure your guys' eyeballs have already gone to, let me just mention, if we continue to increase the intensity, all the way down here to the point where you're like full-fledged sprint as hard as you can go you will get to a point where you're eventually pretty much only relying on carbohydrates almost 100 percent carbs and zero percent fats so let's jump back up to this level of intensity where we found the highest amount of fat being burned and as you probably guessed this would be considered that fat burning zone now we should ask ourselves a couple of questions one is since we found this ideal zone or this fat burning zone should we focus the majority of our training on staying within the zone. Is that the most effective long-term solution to burning fat or losing weight from burning the fat? And if that is the case, how do you get in this zone? And what I mean by that is you can't just tell everybody just to go to 138 beats per minute and you're going to be in this fat burning zone because heart rate and where the fat burning zone is within you depends on various factors. Things like age, genetics, gender, and even fitness status influences where this fat burning zone would be within you. Now, luckily, we don't have to go hook ourselves up to this exercise equipment in a lab to figure out all these details because this fat burning zone is pretty close to this zone that the endurance world or the endurance athletes refer to as zone two. Zone two training would be this level of intensity where yeah, you're working, heart's pumping, you're sweating, but not to the point where you couldn't maintain a conversation with say like a training partner. They often refer to this as the talk test, you can maintain that conversation, 
throughout the duration of that exercise. If you get to a point where you're starting to not be able to finish full sentences, then you're starting to get into these higher levels of intensity and kind of moving out of that zone two or that fat burning zone. For you exercise physiology nerds, that would be like a blood lactate level of about 2.0. But back to that original question. If we found this, is this the area that we should primarily focus on? Is this the greatest influence or the greatest factor when it comes to losing fat and adipose tissue? And the answer to that is no, not really. So then what is the most important thing when it comes to losing weight through burning fat? And what we find is that the total amount of calories burned is actually the more important thing to focus on rather than focusing on the specific ratio of carbs to fats or finding that perfect fat burning zone. Now don't get me wrong, spending time in zone two or this fat burning zone definitely has its benefits that I'm gonna mention in just a second. But again, if the goal is just to lose fat, then the focus should mostly just be on total caloric expenditure or the total amount of calories burned. And to help us illustrate this, there's a really cool study where they took two groups and divided one group into a low intensity group that was doing zone two, the fat burning zone, and then another group was in the high intensity group. Now what they had to account for in those situations was the amount of time, because most of us have a pretty good idea if we spent 30 minutes at the gym and worked at a really high intensity, and then we spent 30 minutes at the gym and worked at a really low intensity, we know we're gonna burn more calories at the higher intensity. So this research study had to account for that, and so the lower intensity group, that zone two fat burning group, their exercise time was increased to match the total calories burned by the higher intensity group. And at the end of the study, what they found is that both groups lost fat or weight at the same rate. There was not a significant difference between the two groups. So the study illustrated the point that total caloric expenditure is the main thing to focus on rather than getting lost in the details of what type of exercise zone you should spend the time in. Now there are pros and cons to both high intensity exercise as well as the lower intensity form like in the zone two or that fat burning zone, which I'll mostly refer to it as zone two from here on out. But with high intensity exercise, some people just enjoy working at that higher intensity. And from a time efficiency perspective, someone who's strapped for time could go to the gym, work at a high intensity, burn as many calories as they could in a shorter amount of time, and then get back to life. Now there are some potential drawbacks to this. If someone is just focusing only on high, high intensity training all the time, they risk overtraining. And they also could miss out on some of the benefits that can come from this zone two training. Now this zone two kind of steady state type of intensity or exercise would have cardiovascular benefits, obviously. The heart will get stronger. Granted, the heart will also get stronger in high intensity training, but there are kind of some unique physiological adaptations that come with zone two training. You'll see an increased number of capillaries that will grow and develop within the muscle tissue, so then the muscles can get more blood flow. You'll also see that the muscle cells will increase the number of mitochondria. Mitochondria utilize things like fats and carbohydrates to create ATP, which is the energy currency of our cells. What we really see with people who focus in on this zone two training is that these mitochondria get really great at utilizing fats for energy. So what you could see is in this zone two or this fat burning zone, on our chart we showed it was about 37.4% fat and 62.6% .6 carbohydrates that were being utilized in that fat burning zone. Someone who spends a lot of time there could potentially shift that ratio a little bit. Maybe they could get it up to like 45% utilization of fats and 55% utilization of carbohydrates. And then you might think, whoa, whoa, Jonathan, you told us to focus on the total number of calories, but now you're telling me that if I spend a lot of time in zone two or the fat burning zone, I could potentially get a little bit of shift in burn fats even more efficiently, and that is true. But even still, there's limitations to this and overall, if one's purpose or main focus is to lose fat, still focusing on the calories is most important. Also to note, say somebody has trained in the zone two for an extended period of time and they have had a shift, kind of creating a higher percentage of fats burned than say somebody who was not spending a lot of time in that zone two. If that person were running for an hour and they still took off in a full-fledged sprint, they're still gonna shift primarily over to carbohydrates. So those are some considerations to make. But that doesn't mean there isn't a really good benefit, especially to those who are concerned with say like endurance events or like 10K races, half marathons, because what can happen is if the body can utilize just even a few more percentage points of fat throughout that race, our bodies can only store about 500 grams of carbohydrates. That's about 2000 calories. 
And if we were just utilizing those for an endurance race, that would only last for about an hour and a half. So someone who is relatively fit and has a relatively healthy body fat percentage can store up to 100,000 calories in fat. So if your body has spent a lot of time in zone two due to your training and you can mobilize fats even with a few more percentage points, that means you can spare some of those carbohydrates to utilize and kind of last longer throughout an endurance event. So let's kind of summarize this and put it all together. Yes, technically there is a fat burning zone, but not necessarily the most important thing to focus on if your main goal is losing fat or adipose tissue. The main thing to focus on is again that overall caloric expenditure or total amount of calories burned. But you still might be thinking, how does that still work, Jonathan, if I'm burning more carbohydrates than fats? Well, something that also contributes to this idea of just focusing on the calories is that there's something called excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. And what that refers to is it takes a little while for our bodies to ramp down after exercise, especially if it's a high intensity exercise. And we have this oxygen debt, if you will. And our body's still trying to replenish all of the ATP that we utilize during the beginning of exercise and throughout exercise. And that replenishment is mostly coming through aerobic type mechanisms or aerobic energy systems that utilize fats to replenish that ATP that we use during exercise. So that can also account for some of the fat that's burned even after exercise. Now, if we're talking about and trying to hone in on the overall ideal plan, it really depends on your fitness goals. Yes, if burning fat is the main goal, we've hammered out that total calories is an important factor to consider. But if you're also concerned with other fitness goals, say like you want to develop this endurance type fitness, maybe you're interested in running marathons or half marathons or 10Ks on the weekend, compared to say somebody who's really concerned with mostly developing strength and developing muscular size and everywhere in between. The person who's focused on developing muscular strength should probably also spend some time developing some cardiovascular fitness in zone two. Somebody who's spending a lot of time in zone two developing that endurance fitness should also probably spend some time strength training and also getting some high intensity intervals. It's just those ratios will change a little bit based on your goals. And obviously everywhere in between with like sports and training for sports is gonna get really sport specific with that, with certain types of training. So the overall ideal thing that I think about with my patients when we're talking about this, we can talk about the physiological numbers, how calories are burned, the ideal fat burning zone, what to do in this situation until we're blue in the face. But it won't matter unless somebody actually buys into consistently exercising, whatever the exercise type is. So I will tell my patients who are struggling with this, can we find a type of exercise that you actually look forward to and enjoy doing, whether that's sport or again, some type of exercise modality. And once we can hone into that, let's get good at being very consistent at that. And then we can tweak and refine it with some other things as necessary. But again, that's the most important thing, consistently exercising and burning those calories if again, we're talking about fat loss. And I almost forgot to mention, can you influence where your body pulls fat from based on exercise choice? For example, if you wanted your rectus abdominis or your six pack muscle to be more visible, could you do a whole bunch of crunches and get your body to mostly pull fat from that area? Unfortunately, the answer is no. We don't really have any control where our body's gonna pull the fat from. That's primarily decided by genetics and even male versus female influences that. Now, you could have a little bit of a discussion about if you were to make the muscle larger and more robust underneath the adipose tissue, it might be a little more visible because of that, but that's much different than actually influencing where your body pulls fat from. Thanks for watching everyone. Hopefully you learned something cool about how our bodies utilize fats and even carbohydrates and can apply that to the wonderful thing that we call exercise. If you're interested in Athletic Greens, go ahead and check out that link in the description below. Like and subscribe if you feel the need. We love reading through those comments, so go ahead and put a comment in the comment section below. And of course, we'll see you in the next video.